Aloha, welcome to Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. We're excited to share this webinar with you today on one of the latest innovations in aviation, hydrogen electric aircraft. First though, I wanna share some information and exciting news from the museum and introduce some of the educators here that help to keep our programs running. So behind the scenes, we have Ford and Eric, and they help to monitor our Q&A and our chats. So if you guys have questions for our guest speakers, please put those in the Q&A and we'll try to ans answer those questions at the end of the program or sometimes even during the program. And in the chat, we like to know where you're from. So to begin our program, if you can introduce yourself and tell us where you're from, we love to know that. And we often get people from around the world. So please do enter that um, location. And we have Ashley, she, she's also joining us today. And in case of any problems, she's the co-pilot for the program and she steps in in case of emergency. So um, just so you know, all of the work that goes behind making these programs. All right, next I'm gonna share the screen and introduce you to one of our newest exhibits at the museum. So you may know or you might not know, but one of the Blue Angels has come to find its resting place at Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. It's Blue Angel number four. It's come from California on Pesha, Hawaii. You can see it here in one of their containers. And it has moved to the Hangar 79 at our museum. Here's a nice picture of it as it was tra traveling across Ford Island and Pearl Harbor is in the background. You can notice that there are some pieces missing there. So it had to be taken apart to, in some pieces to, to make the trip from California to Hawaii. And here, the, this week, the, our restoration department is restoring our putting the puzzle pieces back together. And so from Wednesday, they started and today they have continued to work on that. So people are coming and watching as they put that aircraft back together. So this is just a little sneak peek of what's going on at our museum. And here, this is where it's going to be sitting in Hangar 79. And you can see the wing that uh, needs to be replaced still. So just a little bit of what's going on in the museum, but what you came here for was to hear about this innovation in aviation. And we have a company called Zero Avia with us today. And on the screen, we have the chief financial officer, Katya Akulinichiva, and their CEO and founder, Val Miftikov. So welcome to our program. We're so excited to hear about your company and all of the things that you are doing in aviation. Thank you, Monica. Appreciate it, and team. Uh, great to be here and uh, tell you all about uh, what we're doing. Um, so my name is Val. I'm CEO and founder. Um, I have a, a reasonably long history in the uh, sustainable aviation, uh, sustainable transportation space, um, aviation now. But uh, before that, uh, my previous company was in the uh, electric vehicle space. And we actually have um, a number of projects in uh, Hawaii um, uh, with my previous company. And we were also a cohort um, a company with Elemental Accelerator with uh, my previous company called Electric Motor Works. So across Hawaii, across the state, we have um, uh, hundreds, I think, uh, charging stations uh, made by my previous company that was acquired uh, a little over three years ago. So great connection to the state uh, and uh, to sustainable transport there. And now, uh, as of three years ago, I started uh, Zero Avia with the idea that now we uh, bring sustainability to aviation. Uh, I'm a pilot myself, uh, flying rotorcraft or helicopters and fixed wing or airplanes. Um, and really, there is personal connection here to uh, um, the sustainable sustainability story. Um, we really want to see the future where not only small aircraft, but also larger aircraft, all the commercial aviation is moving to zero emission, moving to sustainable uh, future. And that's what the company is about. So we started three years ago, thought about uh, how we would do it, uh, what kind of technologies uh, would be applicable, would need to develop. Um, and uh, pretty quickly, and let's go to the next slide. Pretty quickly, we um, uh, have zoomed in on a, a, a hydrogen electric approach, which is using hydrogen as uh, primary energy storage on board the vehicle and um, 
hydrogen electric powertrain, which means fuel cells going to electricity and then electric motors and power electronics drive the propulsors or propellers initially and then uh, fans for the larger engines. Um, that approach allows us to get uh, the highest energy density possible in the fuel. Hydrogen is actually three times better uh, on a per kilogram of energy um, uh, than jet fuel. Um, as opposed to batteries, of course, that are much um, uh, less energetic uh, on a per weight basis uh, than jet fuel. And then hydrogen electric fuel cell approach allows us to use that energy in the most efficient way. So to give a comparison for small aircraft, let's say a 20 seat uh, commuter, um, the uh, efficiency of the hydrogen electric uh, powertrain is at least twice as high as a turbine engine that would drive uh, typically those aircraft. So we really think that the future of aviation across multiple segments um, is in the renewably powered hydrogen electric aviation. What renewably powered means is that we want to uh, produce our hydrogen in zero emission way, green hydrogen on site at the airports from the local renewable power. And that's why you know, state of Hawaii and uh, uh, similar uh, sunny locations with a lot of renewable power access are perfect uh, for applications like this. Um, so we started this uh, in California. Next slide. Um, this is uh, what we call the Flying El Camino. Um, as a nice, beautiful 1969 uh, uh, vehicle that we've adapted as our uh, uh, ground testing platform for the first version of our power plants. This is actually, this picture is, I think, from uh, late 2018. And then um, we had, so this is in Hollister, which is um, 50 miles south of San Francisco Bay Area, uh, great airfield, uh, relatively in the middle of nowhere. So we're, we're clear to do... Uh, not quite whatever we want, but uh, but close. Um, so we like that. Um, the next slide is uh, our aircraft, uh, the first uh, prototype that we built um, with our system. Uh, we became um, in February uh, uh, and March 2019, um, we became the largest um, aircraft, zero emission aircraft in the air worldwide uh, when we took this up got the initial certification um, as experimental R&D from the FAA, took it up into the air, um, and had a number of uh, test flights as part of our flight test program um, in the US. And uh, that's when we got uh, a lot of attention worldwide, uh, including um, uh, the UK government um, uh, uh, took notice uh, of us and uh, started um, really uh, uh, looking to bring us uh, to the UK uh, to uh, um, share a part of our R&D program uh, to be uh, located in the United Kingdom. Uh, they provided some grant funding and we've established um, a, a large uh, uh, facility in the UK as well. And I want uh, Katya to talk more about it. Uh, she's actually based in London. Uh, so afternoon, her Friday, Friday evening, her time. Uh, uh, great, uh, great for us to be here. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Katia. So I'm, I'm based in the UK, as Val mentioned. I'm the CFO of the company. I've been here for about a year and a half. So not quite as long of a journey as Val, but I actually did meet him um, in the, when he was fundraising for his previous company. Uh, so I got a chance to see uh, what he's about, but unfortunately we didn't get to, uh, to, 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 to work together in that company, uh, but then rejoined forces again in the summer of 2019. So as Val mentioned, uh, around that time that I joined, we set up our office in the UK um, and really ramped up quite quickly. So the UK government was very supportive of everything that we did here, both directly by funding our, our grant projects, but also through indirect connections and policy level support, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And this all culminated in our probably single biggest technical milestone to date, which was our um, first and largest hydrogen flight in, in hydrogen electric flight in the UK that took place in September last year and got quite a lot of media attention. It was quite nice to see you know, how uh, hungry the world was for positive news during COVID. And I think in particular, uh, this sector was really keen to see how we can maintain the low level of emissions that we've seen when none of us were actually flying around the world. So it was a huge milestone for us. And since then we've continued flying 
the aircraft that you see here, sort of longer distances, um, higher altitudes and things like that. And over the next few years, we'll be building out our program from this aircraft to, 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 to larger aircraft, which again, we'll touch on a bit later. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about sort of how our flight testing has come together. So Val mentioned the first phase that took place in the, in the US. Uh, the UK phase is now very actively ongoing on the six seat aircraft. And the final stage that we have left on that is a 300 nautical mile uh, demo flight that will take place at some point in the next few months, weather permitting, possibly in Scotland in the outer islands, that was our original plan. But if visibility is too difficult, we might have to do that somewhere else. But ultimately the point of all of this was to show that we can fly a meaningfully sized aircraft, a meaningful mission. So this is not just something that we can post on YouTube, but actually something that people can use to get around and to reach destinations that they need. Um, and this I think goes very much to the DNA of our company, which is that we don't just do things for the sake of it. We really like to do things that are practical and that solve real problems that exist today. And that's been our approach all the way through these steps that you see here, as well as everything that we'll do from here onwards. Um, and so to talk a bit more about our first commercial product. Uh, so we're not actually planning to commercialize the six seat aircraft that, that we showed on the previous picture. That has been an R&D step that was very important. We learned a lot, we got it in the air. Uh, it's, it's been again, like a really good validation for the industry of the fact that this is possible. Um, and it's given us a great platform from which to scale to larger aircraft. But our first commercial introduction, we're calling it the ZA600. So it's a 600 kilowatt system that can be used to power aircraft of up to 20 seats. And we're really planning to use that as a replacement for a Pratt & Whitney type of engine in those airframes. And we will be working with the airframes as they are. There will be no change to the airframe. We'll effectively be swapping them one-to-one -one and just flying it on hydrogen electric. Um, and that's quite different to the approach that a lot of other players in the space have taken where they're designing a whole new airframe from scratch they have lots of cool 3D models of what that's gonna look like, but it's probably gonna take them 10 plus years to actually get there. Whereas our approach on our current timeline will get us to a point where we can fly, we can fly a 20 seat airframe next year, or possibly even later this year, and we can do so commercially in 2023 onwards. And in general, the capital requirement for us to start electrifying existing fleets is much lower than it would be if we were to introduce a new airframe. So our proposition to the market is zero emission, and also cheaper, uh, cheaper to operate because it's an electric system, it has lower maintenance requirements and otherwise has all the same performance characteristics um, as a PG6 would. And there's some additional benefits such as it's quieter, which has some interesting implications for the potential of regional transport. So this is really the product that we're working on now. Uh, again, the majority of the R&D is happening in the UK uh, because we continue to get government support here for that but we will also be scaling to other job reviews over time. Um, and I'm really excited to get that flying again later this year and the following year, and then be taking that all the way through to certification and commercial introduction. And so once we have that product, we will be able to power aircraft that look like this. So you might recognize some of these, there's Dorney 228, there's Twin Otters. So these are up to 20 seat uh, passenger wise, and they can both transport people, uh, but there's also some other applications that we started looking into such as agriculture, cargo, emergency, search and rescue, ambulance, things like that. So these aircraft are used quite heavily around the world, sometimes in quite remote locations, other times, you know, just for kind of more commuter style point to point travel. And it makes a very attractive entry point for us and one that we can meaningfully service in a really short time frame. So we're really excited about that. And we'll probably be working on a Dorney 228 for our first R&D platform but then scaling quite quickly to the other airframes that are shown here so that we can really enter the market and in, into all these airframes at once and maximize sort of our commercial opportunity. And then, as I mentioned before, sort of we're, we're not planning to stop there. So we're not just about flying 20 seaters. We, we want to show how that works and we want to capture that market. But then quite quickly after that, we really want to move to the, to the whole ind industry at scale. Uh, so after the 20 seat aircraft, uh, we'll be possibly developing an offshoot into urban sort of electric taxis, which have been picked up a lot of attention recently. Uh, most of them today think they can fly in battery electric, but I think uh, quite quickly they're figuring out that even for that kind of mission and that kind of payload, batteries don't quite do it. And we get a lot of inbound from them uh, to, to discuss partnership opportunities. So that's probably the, the easiest modification of our ZA600 in terms of its power capabilities. And beyond that, we will be moving to larger aircraft, longer missions, 
and introducing more and more technical advances as we do that. So when I, when I talked before about the 20 seater being a direct one-to-one -to -one retrofit opportunity for the next size turboprop, we still want to keep it as close to that model, but certainly beyond that, there will be some changes that will be necessary for the airframe. Um, some of which kind of are necessary to accommodate the fuel, but others are actually advantages that an electric system offers that can lead to quite significant improvements in the, in the airframe, such as uh, distributed propulsion that can help you locate sort of the powertrain in, in, throughout the airframe rather than in one central place and can actually offer quite interesting efficiency considerations that are not available today with a central combustion engine. So really as a company, we plan to be moving quite swiftly across each of these segments such that we can reduce emissions from this industry uh, throughout. Because uh, if you look at regional emission from, from an, uh, regional aviation from an emissions perspective, it is a big contributor. Regional flights are particularly inefficient but of course, to really tackle this industry uh, globally, we, we need to move into these larger aircraft as well. And long term, we also want to work with new airframe types. And in fact, we've actually have already started some of these discussions um, that have you know, quite interesting applications for hydrogen where we can build out the hydrogen electric variant early on into those designs rather than sort of modifying something that already exists. Uh, and on our mission to, to kind of to go into long haul um, and also to sort of illustrate the point about the UK government support, we want to also talk, talk a bit about um, Jet Zero. It's a sort of a, a group um, a council that we've joined here in the UK by invitation from the Prime Minister with the goal of demonstrating cross-Atlantic zero emission flight by 2030. So this highlights a few things. One is just the level of ambition. So cross-Atlantic by 2030 is quite soon. Not many other companies have set goals like that. Is the other point to note here is we think of one of, I think of the only one or maybe one of two startups in this group, the other participants in the group are players like Airbus, Rolls-Royce, GKM, so really multi tens of thousands employee <laughs> groups. And the third point is, yeah, the government here has been really committed and really supportive of us and has really put us in the forefront of this movement, all of, of which has been uh, really instrumental to, to getting us to move at the pace that we have. So this is kind of one of our targets um, over the next few years to really get to this to this um, uh, to this size aircraft and to the to this um, mission. Um, and in addition to our work on the powertrain itself um, and the associated work on the airframe, we're also doing quite a lot on the refueling infrastructure side. So our solution is only as green as the hydrogen is green that we use. Um, and you know, if you go to an airport today, you won't probably find a hydrogen refueling facility available immediately. So we recognize that this is part of uh, the rollout of our technology and, for, and are therefore really thinking this through very carefully early on. So in our, at our UK facility, which is located at Cranfield University, where we've done most of our test flights so far, we already have our own hydrogen refueling facility. So this is what you can see in the pictures here. Uh, we are using renewable electricity that is generated near site, and we have our own on-site electrolysis production uh, where we can produce whatever we need for, for, for our flight needs. And, you know, if anybody else happens to drop in on a hydrogen electric aircraft, we can also refuel them. Um, and then we've got a refueling truck that you can also see here, which goes from the electrolysis to our aircraft in exactly the same way as jet aircraft are refueled today, refuels the aircraft for, for travel. And we also happen to have a couple of hydrogen electric cars uh, that I think have mainly been used for team transport sort of around site, but can support, you know, multimodal use and illustrate how that works. And I mean, certainly once this scales uh, commercially, that is a big part of how we think this is gonna work. So we, we really want to see big hydrogen refuel refueling facilities at the airport that can be used for buses, for trucks, for cars, which de-risks, um, the, the opportunity for the fuel provider makes it commercially interesting um, and also makes, makes this really viable for us and for airlines at scale. Um, so while this is not our core business, we do see ourselves playing a big part in the rollout of this, certainly in the early days and maybe beyond. And actually when we work with the operators, we're planning to sell our product to them on an all in sort of propulsion as a service, power by the hour model, including fuel because we think that we have significant economies of scale in procuring this fuel from the fuel providers that we can benefit from. And we can also significantly de-risk the acquisition of that fuel for the aircraft. So from its very small scale today to the large kind of commercial scale that will be needed once we are rolling our product out, we see ourselves playing a big role in the hydrogen infrastructure piece of all of this. Um, and, and 
yeah, I'm sort of excited to see how this piece takes up, it takes off. And later I'll talk a bit about our investment round, but I just want to mention that we're partnering us already with Shell on the provision of, of uh, green hydrogen. I will be working with many other players hopefully over the next few months to do this in different parts of the world. But yeah, so that's uh, the, uh, kind of the slide that I was just referring to. So we've been very fortunate to be supported by a, a number of investors and partners that have really helped us around the world. So we already talked quite a lot about the UK government. We've also gotten quite a lot of uh, support from the private sector. Uh, so up until December last year, we were predominantly funded by our founder as well as a number of other seed investors um, and actually also the institution that I used to work for, which is a kind of early stage climate tech investing firm and uh, climate sustainability firm. But then the last year we closed a large uh, a series A funding round from a number of private investors, including Breakthrough Energy Ventures, uh, that's backed by Bill Gates and a few others, and also Amazon and Shell. Um, and we chose the investor consortium very deliberately. All of those are people that can continue to back us on our journey and have real sources of strategic value to us. So it's not just money, it's not just a check. They have really strong links in their respective geographies. And in the case of Amazon, they can be our launch customer in the cargo area. And in the case of Shell, they can be a close partner for us on the refueling side. So we're really excited to have their backing um, and we'll be definitely moving on our journey even faster with them on our side. Um, and then on the accelerator front, we've worked with a number of accelerators around the world, but the one probably most relevant for today um, is Elemental Accelerator, uh, who's ba based in Hawaii, uh, as well as um, they have a location in California. So Val mentioned his previous company was part of a, the Elemental Accelerator a few years ago, and Zeravia made it into their latest cohort, which just kicked off in October this year. Um, they've been extremely supportive across the board, including on recruiting and fundraising and general kind of corporate business development matters. Uh, but in particular, what we're working with them on um, is a demonstration project in the Asia Pacific region. So Hawaii is one possible location. We are looking at a couple of other possibilities and the aim is to kind of form a consortium with um, a local airport, a local op operator, possibly an airframe manufacturer as well. And, and work to a point where we have a commercially relevant demonstration project that we can all start working on so that we can initially just show how that aircraft would fly um, um, a relevant route, but then over time actually launch our airframe, in, um, our, well, our product within the airframe um, into operation in that region. Uh, so Elemental has been very supportive already. And over the course of this year, we're gonna be making that, that project a reality. Um, and I guess one thing to also mention is through Elemental, there is an internship uh, that they sponsor uh, that will be probably at our California location. So for anybody who is looking at career opportunities, that one might be a particularly relevant. So they have a scheme where for all their portfolio companies, they, they sponsor summer internship positions. So that's kind of yet another way that they've been really helpful to us. Um, and I guess just a final sort of uh, picture here is our team. Uh, so this is us at our Cranfield facility on the day of our first hydrogen flight. So it was pretty big deal for us. We were all riding a lot of adrenaline, especially Val who was actually in the, the plane himself, but I'm sure everybody in the team who was directly involved was also pretty nervous throughout the day, but it went really well. And we had, we had Sky News, we had many people from the government visiting us and it was a really exciting day. And despite lockdown and COVID and bad weather and all those things, we made it happen. And it was a really, really big moment for us. Um, and I guess this also just segues us into sort of, you know, how can you get involved and uh, kind of what might a career look like for you here? I mean, I'm probably an atypical example in that I, I don't have a background in aviation. Um, I had to uh, watch YouTube videos about how planes work when I joined the company. And I also don't actually like flying. I'm quite scared of it. So this was not a very obvious career choice for me, but I joined just because I think this is a huge problem. Not enough companies are working on it. And I think this is the team with the most practical uh, and the solution with the most potential. Um, and it's really great for people to work with us. such a big problem with. And what we've achieved in just the year and a half that I've been involved has been really amazing. And I'm really excited to see what this looks like going forward. And I've learned a lot about aviation in, in the meantime. Uh, but generally we're at a, in a very quickly growing uh, sort of stage of our company now. We're recruiting across the company and predominantly in the engineering team, but we are also recruiting a lot across business development, finance, strategy, operations, so lots of different openings. A lot of them are in the UK, but we do have also a few in the US. Um, so it'd be great to have more people um, join us on our journey. 
So I'll, I'll end here and we're really looking forward to questions and an engaged discussion with everyone. Thank you. All right, I'm just going to um, take the screen back and we'll start with some of the questions that have been rolling in. But while I'm doing that, Val, maybe you can talk a little bit about your career path. I know that you started with a, um, you were a pilot and during your free time um, pilot and helicopter, but you also have a background in physics and uh, things like that. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, yeah, so I'm originally from Russia, um, moved to the United States um, about 23, 24 years ago. Um, studied physics back there, uh, and then studied physics here on the East Coast, and then um, uh, at uh, Stanford uh, Lab um, as well for about five years. Um, it was in the uh, in Silicon Valley when the dot com boom was happening. And then, of course, you know, the, the, the bus side as well. Um, but during the boom times, 98, 99, it was, uh, it was pretty crazy. Um, and it was hard for me to understand how people can uh, you know, still study among all of this at Stanford. Uh, and, of course, a lot of them were, bra were breaking out and uh, starting the companies and everything. So that, I think, uh, affected uh, me as well and kind of created this. Um, pushed for the move uh, on the business side. And um, I started a couple of uh, companies early on, mostly in the you know, more traditional kind of th those days, IT outsourcing space, uh, had offices back in Russia doing software development, this and that. And then um, the, uh, the bust uh, caught up to us a little bit. Uh, and that's when I joined uh, uh, McKinsey and Company. Uh, the uh, global consulting firm um, had a lot of fun, lots of different projects worldwide. Uh, uh, I ha and actually, that, that's that's partially why I left uh, McKinsey. I uh, found myself at some point uh, doing these uh, two week uh, around the globe uh, sort of flight tours, um, right? Multiple clients uh, in Asia, Europe, uh, United States, and I had to as a uh, partner, I had to kind of go around and visit all the teams, all the clients, and uh, was a 1K member in the United and all those things, and uh, lots of uh, carbon footprint for sure. Um, and I uh, didn't want to continue that. Uh, uh, that's when I left uh, McKinsey, joined Google. Uh, done a lot of interesting things there as well, including working with Google X uh, team on various things. Um, and uh, um, at some point, uh, decided to go back to entrepreneurial uh, side of things, and that's when I started uh, my previous company, the um, electric vehicle company. The the pilot, uh, the aviation link was actually, um, you know, while I was at McKinsey, uh, one of the vacations uh, went to Hawaii, you know, took a helicopter tour with uh, Blue Hawaiian. Uh, they had some uh, crazy ex-Vietnam pilots uh, that were piloting those helicopters and they, the guys just took off and uh, like, hey, I got to learn how to do that. So I came back um, and enrolled into a school and that was, uh, I think, 2006. Um, so I got my helicopter license first and then after I kind of explored the entire California on a helicopter, um, uh, I realized that actually to move from A to B, you need an airplane license. And that's how I got the airplane license. Um, but uh, the whole aviation thing started from Hawaii, actually. Mm, wow, what a yeah. great connection. <laughs> oh, I, um, I love how your company and how you and Katya are so um, inspired by trying to solve problems. You mentioned you're trying to make a uh, quieter for regional transport. Um, you're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, decarbonizing flight. And it seems like your technology is advancing, but what are, it, and it seems like the limitation is not with the technology, but with uh, something else. Can you explain a little bit about where um, your limitations might be in your goal? To yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the limitations, well, let's, let's call them challenges, okay? Yeah, that's better. Uh, there are, of course, challenges. Yeah, there are, of course, challenges. Um, uh, with bringing new technology to uh, to aviation, to any any segments really, but aviation in particular, given the regulatory environment and the uh, performance requirements and, and whatnot. What we like about this approach, the hydrogen electric approach, is that there are no new 
fundamental physics um, improvements or uh, discoveries needed to make it work, right? Mm -hmm. So in some other uh, areas, um, like battery electric, for example, um, you need some um, pretty strong fundamental discoveries uh, to happen in material science um, and so forth in order to uh, um, be credible uh, with applications in larger aircraft. Even And larger means, you know, even 10, 20 seaters, um, even for a couple of hundred miles, already stressing it out, right? Mm -hmm. um, so with hydrogen electric, you don't have those types of limitations or those types of challenges on the fundamental physics side. Um, uh, but it's a lot of engineering, right? So engineering challenges include, uh, it's still much heavier than a turbine. So we're working quite, uh, quite a lot on that, um, both on the uh, power plant side itself, um, on the fuel cell system, but also on the fuel storage, right? Especially um, uh, our initial uh, uh, commercial products will be based on the compressed gas storage, which means um, heavy tanks, um, uh, uh, very sturdy, but, uh, but heavy uh, composite tanks. So weight is uh, one of the uh, primary figures of merit uh, for aviation applications. So really paying attention to that, looking at different technologies. Uh, They're trying a lot um, and working on uh, you know, improving that side. Um, outside of the technical domain um, or close to technical domain is the regulatory side of things. And I, I saw some questions um, sort of coming up on the Q&A side on the regulatory sides, the certification path and all those things. So we of course been working with FAA and CAA for uh, the last uh, couple of years already. Um, the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK is actually a formal uh, member um, of uh, our consortium of the projects uh, that we have with the UK government. And having um, the direct government support helps in prioritizing um, our project at the right level. Uh, with the uh, with the regulators, um, so we have pretty productive relationship, and uh, the certification basis that we're looking for is uh, uh, a, a variation of the um, sort of R33 um, uh, engine or power plant certification uh, type certification, and then STC supplemental type certificates for specific airframes. Um, we already have. Um, discussions with, um, I think it's seven or eight now, um, aircraft manufacturers um, that uh, want to be um, uh, some of the first uh, STC hold, um, uh, applications. Um, and uh, later this year, we're looking to uh, make a decision who the launch uh, airframes will be. Uh, and that's also will be based on the discussions with the operators. Hmm. Well, I think that um, a lot of people have been asking questions about the propulsion system. So a lot of questions about the choices that you've made. So um, Tara is asking, are you combining hydrogen and oxygen to generate electricity to power the electric engine? Yeah, so oxygen from air. Um, so we don't carry oxygen on board the aircraft, uh, at least not yet. Um, so um, it's an uh, air breathing machine. Um, so the, the way it works is um, uh, part of the uh, system is the um, air compression um, uh, subsystem that provides uh, compressed air uh, and oxygen to the uh, fuel cell uh, to operate. And then hydrogen, and oxygen combine and uh, produce electricity and water. I had a question from a, an audience member who couldn't participate in the show, but I uh, was wondering about the um, choice of hydrogen over other gases like ammonia. He said, ammonia is not as explosive as hydrogen, has more hi uh, free hydrogen than hydrogen itself. So why did you choose uh, hydrogen over other gases like ammonia? Yeah, so ammonia is a uh, liquid at uh, room temperature, which is good. Uh, and uh, the weight fraction is, um, I believe, uh, somewhere between uh, 15 and 18 percent, depending on the density and all that, uh, and the tank structure, which is significantly higher uh, than compressed, um, although not as much higher. So we are getting to about 12 percent mass fractions today with compressed uh, gas. Um, so it's getting close uh, to the ammonia densities. And with um, eventual move to cryogenic uh, liquid hydrogen, um, it will be easy to surpass that. Now, 
Um, ammonia also has some disadvantages. Um, it's a, it, it has extreme toxicity. Um, so uh, leaks of uh, ammonia as fuel on board aircraft um, uh, will be quite catastrophic uh, if happen. Um, so from the safety perspective, um, it could be actually much more complicated uh, to push through on board aircraft um, than hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Another question about the hydrogen, um, green hydrogen. Gigi is asking if you can comment on the logistics of green hydrogen, uh, for example, how to compete with the existing demand, which is not yet up to production. Yeah, no, uh, let me let me try to answer. Not sure I understand fully, but um, our approach is uh, on-site production um, at the airports, yeah, with local or renewable power, uh, which eliminates the need for transportation of uh, fuel from central production facility to the point of consumption. It actually um, makes it possible to use airports that are generally are located um, in the intersection of freeways uh, um, and major transportation hubs um, uh, as they are. Uh, it could be good nodes for the uh, hydrogen refueling infrastructure even for the ground applications, right? But um, if you look at any airports um, with the amount of fuel that it consumes, if it has any kind of commercial traffic, um, it's very, very high concentration. So um, the scale of production immediately makes sense for on-site production. Mm -hmm. And that drives cost quite a bit down. Yeah. A, a related question. Um, you, you talked about it a little bit about how you are partnering with other companies and you um, are you have heavy composite tanks. But Rob was asking that, um, you know, that there's U.S. has hydro cars and they, the fuel stations are somewhat of a concern. Um, is there any other things that you are doing to solve the, the safety concern problems? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, the uh, the regulators, of course, looking at this, and, um, and and we're looking at that as well. Um, we we have uh, activities around the uh, safety side, both on the um, on the ground based uh, installations that we have. Uh, right, uh, Kaita highlighted uh, some of the uh, pioneering ground work that we're doing, and also in the air, of course, and. Um, uh, the, the fact that we have flown actual aircraft in uh, both uh, uh, FAA and CAA jurisdictions um, uh, means that, uh, um, at least from the experimental R&D perspective, um, uh, experimental aircraft certification perspective, the regulators were happy with the approach that we were taking, mm -hmm. uh, which in Europe uh, is a quite a high bar already for experimental aircraft, um, partially because um, you know, the, the regulators are more um, uh, conservative um, and uh, you know, maybe part of the reason is that a higher uh, population density, uh, more complex airspace. We are you know, 30 miles north of London um, city boundary and uh, we're next to uh, multiple large airports with complex airspace. So, so people care. Um, and uh, we had uh, very significant safety reviews and uh, system reviews with the regulators. Mm. I, we have one more question about propulsion, um, and this one is from Chip. He's asking, what is the weight of the fuel and tank as opposed to traditional aviation fuel? Um, cons I'm concerned about the hydrogen under pressure is too dangerous. What about solid storage materials such as boron instead of compressed gas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um... Well, on the weight side, the so two two parts of the question, I guess, weight and the uh, and the safety and uh, metal hydrides um, uh, type storage. So on the um, um, uh, on the first part, on the weight, the the way to think about it, which is you know, it, it may, makes it easier to kind of understand the trade offs, is that for the first commercial introduction that we're planning with a fuel cell system and compressed gas storage will be able to deliver half of the max range of the aircraft right so typically those aircraft that that you saw catch uh, going through the 10 to 20 seat aircraft they're designed for about a thousand miles of range we'll be able to get to about 500 miles of range uh, in those aircraft um, while preserving their passenger capacity, right? So 10 to 20 seat um, uh, capacity. 
Um, the engines are heavier, um, but uh, some of the other elements are um, uh, uh, turning out to be about the same um, weight uh, as the uh, as the jet fuel. Um, and there is efficiency uh, calculation that goes in, like I mentioned, you know, twice uh, twice as efficient on hydrogen electric compared to the jet fuel. So all of those factors play into it. So it's not a simple apples to apples comparison, but generally works out to about half the range um, with uh, the same max passenger payload. Then the safety side, actually compressed gas uh, uh, storage is... Uh, probably going to be the the safest part of the aircraft and the most structurally sound part of the aircraft in any kind of uh, event. Um, and this has been used um, in so far about 100,000 vehicles on the ground. Um, most of those vehicles are various material handling equipment um, that you know, are used in warehouses around the world, Amazon and uh, Walmart, uh, probably the largest users, but really everywhere. And then about 15,000 cars um, in operation with you know, unqualified operators, right? Um, uh, regular people uh, driving those cars, showing up at the fueling stations and handling uh, 700 bar uh, hydrogen refueling. Um, mm -hmm. So there has been a, a lot of uh, uh, safety systems and safety protocols that are already designed, uh, put into practice on the grounds. And of course, we're leveraging a lot of that. Um, the metal hydride storage specifically, we looked at it, of course. Uh, the problem is um, the uh, weight, um, the, the mass fractions are uh, quite low. Uh, today, the best in class is around 6 7%, uh, which is about half of what uh, we can get with compressed. And um, the best in the, um, not even in the lab, but uh, the, the, the best uh, fraction that we've seen so far, theoretical of the uh, computer simulated material is about uh, 15%, right? Which is, uh, you know, computer simulated to uh, practice practical product that you can actually buy and certify for safety are two different things. We've been talking a lot about propulsion, safety, and uh, we actually have quest a lot of quest more questions coming in about the engine itself, the renewable energy, and f the flight of the aircraft. So I want to switch topics a little bit to the engine. And David is asking about the PT-6 is one of the most reliable engines ever built. Do you believe your retrofit will have the same reliability? Yes, we do, um, in fact. And um, in the, uh, uh, of course, you know, there's a lot of testing uh, that we need to do, and there is um, there is a lot of work uh, before we get it uh, through the certification. But um, there are some fundamentals that are just um, um, fundamentally better uh, for a hydrogen electric approach and electrified powertrains in general, right? And you see those benefits from uh, the electric vehicle revolution uh, on the grounds as well. Um, I know how many people out of 45 participants now uh, drive electric, but uh, if you do, you know what I mean. Um, and uh, I myself and uh, my family is all electric household for the last uh, 11, 12 years. And uh, I don't remember when I was last in the service uh, um, you know, department. Um, we, we just, you know, my, my wife's driving a Chevy Bolt um, and uh, for the second lease uh, term and uh, you know, uh, we, we had a trip to the dealership uh, to get the car, and then we had a trip to the dealership to give them back the car and get the new one. And then it's been a year and a half since then, and, you know, nothing happens, right? Um, so uh, just fundamentally from the physics perspective, you're not having as many moving parts. You're not having high temperature, high pressure operation, high temperature cycles that drive maintenance um, requirements on the, um, uh, on the turbines and on the, um, you know, uh, generally internal combustion engines. So every time you start up that PT6, you have a 1000 C uh, cycle, thermal cycle that goes up and down. Um, and that creates tremendous amount of um, uh, material stresses. And, you know, to the point that 
of these days, the modern um, uh, turbine engines, uh, they have to be produced, uh, you know, the larger ones, not V2.6, but larger ones from a single crystal of, uh, uh, of you know, material, um, the turbine disks, right? Uh, otherwise, they, they can't withstand the stress. So all of that stress results in uh, higher maintenance costs. Mm. All right, a couple more related questions to this is, um, are you planning to have the engine retrofitted into piston powered airplanes? Um, there are some discussions um, about some of the, uh, some of the trainer aircraft um, that could be useful um, platform for us to, because you, you have to think about like eventually full chain, right? So not as a first product, but as we get these things into commercial, um, we'll probably have the uh, growing requirements to train people on the aircraft that will, um, you know, look like and behave like the air, the commercial aircraft that they will go to, right? So eventually, we will need to get the training aircraft uh, into hydrogen electric as well if we are going to have a strong, um, you know, long-term industry there. Right, because we will need to train people on it. Um, so we have some uh, some project discussions around that. This is not the primary um, uh, sort of commercial target for us, uh, but definitely will be part of the story over time. You um, uh, previously you were talking about the value in renewable energy. So we had some questions about that, and Wyatt was asking, "Have you tested renewable energy in other major cities um, to test which location had the best energy output?" Well, I mean, that's that's been tested for us by um, a number of people, right? The renewable energy industry is quite uh, robust. And uh, there are solar maps and wind maps and geothermal maps and uh, hydro maps and all of that, right? So different industries or different locations have different mix up, right? So, you know, Pacific Northwest, uh, Norway, hydropower, right? Uh, UK, wind dominated. Um, north, southwest United States, Hawaii, solar, right? So depending on the location, different sources, but um, uh, everywhere there is access. And uh, actually, and that's, that's what I was doing. A big part of what I was doing with my previous company was actually not just charging stations, but the, point, the whole point was um, smart charging off electric vehicles to map the demands into the intermittent supply of renewables. And the major problem, and Hawaii actually was the first to discover it, right? And then, you know, California had it, and then it rolled uh, sort of through um, various areas. The major problem with increasing solar penetration, increasing wind penetration, is the ability to absorb intermittent power. And without storage, the grid today doesn't have for all practical purposes, doesn't have has zero storage, right? Everything that's produced can, has to be consumed near instantaneously, and that's a big problem for renewable integration. And that was the whole point behind my previous company um, that we saw the opportunity in these millions and billions of vehicles, eventually electric vehicles, providing that balancing service that you can time the charging, the consumption to the right. Um, you know, production time when the you know, sun shines and wind blows. Same thing can be done with hydrogen electric uh, aviation, right? So hydrogen production from uh, renewable power is effectively a, a, one of the perfect ways to store energy, right? So we need to use that energy anyway, we need that energy. Um, and then we have gas, uh, hydrogen as an interim storage that we can then use in the aircraft. And that way we will actually be able to integrate more, much higher renewable content into the energy mix um, uh, worldwide uh, across all industries, right? And especially for places like Hawaii, where, you know, uh, I don't know exactly what it is now, but back in the day when I was doing the, um, uh, the smart charging project, there were already regulations against putting more solar a residential solar in uh, in Hawaii uh, because of um, the constraints uh, for how much grid can absorb. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, Matthew is asking, uh, he is an operations manager for a major US airline. And he said that you mentioned sustainable ways of developing hydrogen refueling at small and mid-level airports, utilizing these renewable sources. So what about larger airports? Yeah, great question. Uh, great question. I mean, these things do scale. Okay, if you, uh, and we looked at um, some of the, uh, you know, hypothetical at this point, but um, uh, sort of scaling parameters for uh, large airports and how much surface area we would need for, for example, for production plants um, in order to uh, uh, supply a larger airport. And actually, you know, the, the amount of space that you need to take with the production facilities are similar to the amount of space that is taken today by fuel processing facilities that you already have at major uh, airports, at larger airports. Um, so you, you, you do have, you know, fuel storage. Um, some airports have uh, refineries even uh, uh, working for them nearby. Um, and that space is about, you know, order of magnitude, about the same amount of space that you would need for production of um, sufficient amount of hydrogen to replace that fuel supply. So on the sort of this parametric level, without actually building anything yet, we feel pretty confident that this is a solvable problem. Some questions about the flight of the aircraft. Kyle's asking, what are the difference in piloting these aircraft compared to traditional power plants? Yeah, actually uh, not a lot. Um, so they uh, much quieter inside and I'm, I'm, you know, basing on the experience, actual experience in the six seat aircraft that we, uh, that, that I actually flew. Um, across uh, these two prototypes. Um, so because you don't have the engine vibration and engine noise, right, especially compared with the, uh, with the piston engine, it's relatively silent, yeah. Um, uh, compared with turbine, uh, maybe not as much less, but still uh, um, uh, less noise inside uh, the cabin. Definitely less noise outside. Um, also, uh, we've done some tests uh, on the aircraft um, in uh, various uh, propeller speed um, uh, uh, sort of variant operations. Um, and with electric motor, because of the uh, much wider power band, uh, which means that you can deliver the same amount of power across much wider um, range of uh, rotational speeds, you have more flexibility how fast your propeller can rotate. Um, and the noise from the prop is proportional to something like fifth or sixth power of uh, uh, tip speed that are usually uh, you know, designed for max power to uh, get into transonic uh, uh, state. So you have a lot of noise coming off of those um, uh, vortices. Uh, so we were able to um, actually reduce uh, the, the normal speed for our prop is about 2,500 RPM. Uh, we were able to reduce it to all the way down to 1,600 uh, while producing the same amount of power. Um, and uh, still, you know, propelling the aircraft in the, in cruise, and you can't hear it, right? 500 feet away, you cannot hear it. Um, uh, so noise outside can be reduced quite a bit uh, as well, just because you have that flexibility um, on the power band. Uh, and those are exciting, you know, opportunities that are not possible, not really possible with uh, internal combustion engines uh, very easily. And uh, Sal was asking about flight altitude. Uh, would that make any difference with the efficiency like conventional engines? Yeah, so uh, this is an air breathing uh, machine. So it, it, it is affected by altitude. Um, so the way we do it is, uh, you know, we size the system so that it's uh, flat rated to uh, a certain um, altitude. And then you have um, sort of degradation of performance just like a turbine engine would or, or a piston engine would. Um, we are right now, we're designing the first um, uh, sort of product to be flat rated to uh, anywhere between 10 and 15,000 feet. Um, and then uh, bringing it up to maybe 20,000 feet, um, uh, which is, you know, roughly on par with the, um, uh, with the current engines. But yes, you have, you know, obviously because of the air density decreasing, you have uh, effect. I had a question from Barbara and she was just asking how different was your technical approach versus what um, Airbus and others are pursuing? 
Well, it's a good question, partially because um, Airbus and others don't uh, don't tell anybody what they're pursuing. Um, but um, we think that uh, in the end, uh, people will do what makes sense, um, and uh, we've uh, we've put a, a good amount of thought into uh, what makes sense. So I think uh, in the end, uh, we'll end up um, all in roughly the same place. You know, we we started couple of years ago. Um, we want to work with uh, aircraft manufacturers like Airbus. So it was only good for us uh, uh, to see them um, uh, publicly committing to hydrogen and uh, um, coming up with uh, the concepts of new aircraft uh, for hydrogen operation, which is over a longer period of time, it will be, re will be necessary, right? So we can, uh, we can repower existing types of aircraft um, up to certain size and up to certain um, uh, mission length, right? Or stage length, yeah? And generally we think uh, we can get to, uh, in, in, a, in a pretty reasonable way, we can get to maybe a hundred seat and thousand miles, right? Mm -hmm. So with the existing aircraft types. Beyond those, right, larger and or longer would require aircraft redesign. Yeah, because you need more volume and maybe you need to change the wings and this and that, right? Maybe more propulsors for higher power um, uh, per vehicle. And that's when where all these new concepts are coming in, right? So Airbus had these, these nice, interesting, you know, wing body design that has enough volume to store enough hydrogen for 5,000, you know, 7,000 mile operation, right? Which eventually will be needed. And we think on the time scale of you know, 20, 30 years, that's where we get to. Mm -hmm. Well, I love the um, statement that you made about the principles just making sense um, because as a previous physics and chemistry teacher to middle school age, I, I've listened to your presentation and I've done a little research and uh, you use the basic principles of electrolysis and some of the basic principles of physics and it does seem to just make sense. So uh, we had a question from one of our um, viewer, uh, viewers here today who is also a teacher, Wyatt, and he sponsors a STEM club. And so he was asking if uh, you do things like um, coordinating would it be possible for you to coordinate a meeting with his students? So is this something that you, that you will do or um, would be? Yeah, let's, uh, let's connect, uh, connect offline. Yeah. <laughs> I know it would be great to see those connections. When I was doing these experiments back in my classroom and uh, just trying to split the hydrogen oxygen out of water, I think to hear where it might go and to actually see the, where it's going with your company, it would be, so fascinating for those students to see that. So I'm all um, for what Wyatt's idea of having you come and visit the classroom. So hopefully we can make that happen. Well, we do have a few more questions, but we are running out of time. And I wanna make sure that we honor your time. You've um, spent a whole hour with us today talking about your company and also about um, some of the greatest innovations that you're doing and what the future possibilities might hold. So um, just wanted to see if there was any last minute things that you wanted to make sure that our viewers knew um, about yourselves or your company before we have to say goodbye. No, thanks. Uh, I think, um, as, as Katya mentioned, uh, you know, this is a great new field. Um, there's going to be a huge need for um, uh, sustainable revolution in aviation. This is going to be likely a one of the largest problems that we're going to have, uh, one of the hardest problems that we're going to have on the way to, uh, you know, that zero that everybody wants to end up. So this is a um, this is going to be a large industry, um, and uh, for for those who think about uh, you know maybe future and what to do, um, this is uh, I, I would want to just uh, uh, you know put it um, out there that this is a, this is a high uh, high potential area, and consider uh, you know uh, exploring opportunities there. Yes, I love that idea. Um, just the career pathway that you have with renewable energy and it combines with aviation, but also on Katya's side, the, the more business side, um, the people that are interested in finance, but also want to be contributing to sustainable um, and renewable energy. This is another, another way to do it. So Katya, any last words from you? No, I mean, I think um, 
having worked on a number of what I thought were difficult sectors uh, to, to decarbonize and to make it more sustainable. I mean, I think, I think aviation is a really good example of you know, how unfit for a purpose a lot of the funding structures that we have today are. You know, you know the, I think it, not many organizations out there today know how to take appropriate risk and how to really think long-term. And it's something that I've learned a lot now from both sides of the equation, having initially been on the investor side, now on the company side. I think that's changing. I think there are more dedicated vehicles that are really passionate about delivering the mission in a commercially viable way um, and are able to take that longer term perspective, but it, it is still missing. So I'm just excited to see how the rest of the ecosystem responds uh, to the solutions that we're putting forward to these challenges, but that do need funding and do need external support. Um, I think we've been a good example, um, both on the public side, we, you know, we've, we've really benefited from that support and I hope that there are more examples of those kinds of partnerships, but then also on the private side of bringing together the real climate focused you know, big money with deep pockets, as well as the more corporates that have a strategic interest in seeing this happen. Um, but, you know, many other companies in the clean tech innovation space haven't been as lucky as us. And I just really hope that there are more organizations out there to support these kinds of companies and, and take the, the, the really tough decisions and take the tough risks, but that will pay off in the long term. Yeah, definitely. So um, I have to say, take this moment to say thanks to Elemental Accelerator for just connecting a museum with Zero Avia. If it wasn't for them, we, we wouldn't have been introduced to your story. And I feel so um, inspired by your story, but also grateful that we have this positive message to start 2021, um, just of the possibilities of renewable energy and all of the great things that your company is doing. So thank you again, Val and Katya for joining us this morning. We really appreciated your time. And thanks then, for having us. Thanks. And then thanks also to our viewers who uh, come to join us for this program. If you missed any of it, we're going to create the YouTube video uh, recording after this and we'll post that on our website. So um, if you didn't happen to see that or if you have someone that wanted a friend that wanted to see it, please let them know. And to all of you that are not here in Hawaii, we hope that uh, you will someday soon come and visit us. We would love to have you visit our museum. So. For now though, we'll have to say aloha from Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. <laughs>